thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's great to be here tonight. Uh, I thought a lot about what I was going to say. You're a very tough audience, not because you're mean, but because you're so diverse, not necessarily racially diverse, although I'm sure ethnicity is a factor in our audience, but some of you, those of you who are students, were little babies when I was chairman of the NEA. Others here are skilled arts advocates who have worked to advance the cultural life of our, of our nation for years, for decades. Uh, others are faculty members who are expert in American culture. So it was very difficult to think of, of just what to say. I'll try to say something for everybody. It's, it's, it's great to be here in part because I get to see old friends. Kurt Dewhurst and Marsha McDowell have already been mentioned a couple of times. Peggy Plimpton from the NEH, and of course Barry Bergey, uh, a colleague from my years at the, at the Arts Endowment. John Barkley from your, old, your own Michigan Council, great arts leader. Sarah Triplett, wife of your mayor and very uh, strong advocate here in the state. So all of these old friends uh, are part of the community that has advanced the arts uh, here in the United States. And it's great to be here in Michigan, not too far from the university I graduated from back in the middle 1960s, the one that came so very, very, very close <laughs> last weekend. I don't hold it against you. But tonight back in Michigan, back here on stage with you, I'm still pretty far from my hometown, Calumet, up in the UP, a village that, as the car drives, is a good 500 miles north and west of East Lansing. Distance can mean difference. When I was young, my family would drive to Detroit for spring vacation, drive overnight, depart that snow cover in Calumet to enjoy the earthy aroma of early spring in the big city. We shopped at J.L. Hudson's, sipped a Werner's ice cream float, visited the big city enclave where Cornish, where Cousin Jack, friends and relatives had settled, where those families had settled, when they sought jobs in Detroit during the Great Depression. And then riding the bus downtown, frankly, we tried not to stare at African-American passengers. They were exotic. In the 1950s, Calumet had neither black residents nor black tourist visitors. So distance in Michigan was and is not just geographical, it is also cultural. And metaphorically, the spectrum of culture represented by the ethnic heritage of Finns, Native Americans, Italians, Cornishmen up in Calumet on one hand, the great fine arts traditions of Detroit Symphony and Wonderful Art Institute, Motown and jazz in Detroit on the other, define both, I think, the opportunities and the challenges inherent in connecting the arts with public policy. So during the next few minutes, I'll talk about the National Endowment for the Arts, reflect a bit on the distance traveled over the last half century, and then speculate a bit about what it will take for us to secure a place for art in public policy during the 50 years to come. And that part is particularly addressed to, to students because I'm not gonna be around to make the next 50 years happen, but you will. A few quick points, a bit of history. Although members of Congress talked about government and culture as far back as the Eisenhower administration, the plan that became the NEA really was created in the Kennedy years. And then and now, that administration, that Kennedy administration, was the most elite art-oriented administration in, in American history. The Kennedy years represent a kind of culmination, a kind of triumph of what you might call high middle brow culture here in the US. Think about pianist Van Cliburn or abstract painter Jackson Pollock on magazine covers. Pablo Casals in the state dining room in the Kennedy administration. So back then to speak of the arts was automatically to talk about the fine arts, European origin, Jazz kind of worked its way in for 
artistic, but mostly political reasons. That's another talk I'd like to give sometime. But the challenge facing leaders in foundations and government seemed clear. Make the fine arts more available to the American people. This meant touring, institution building, musicians, poets, dancers, and actors in schools. Point one. Second point is that in the long term, this approach was probably a bit off-center. Ultimately, in the context of America's democracy, in our diverse creative universe, or in Michigan's diverse universe, for that matter, an elite fine arts approach to policy came with a kind of built-in ceiling. And of necessity, the NEA, to, very, to its great credit, and almost from its inception, began to improvise and to innovate and to redirect its resources, at least a little bit. Consider our program this evening. As Barry uh, mentioned, there, there were no National Heritage Fellows in 1965 when the endowment was created. In fact, there was no program in folk arts until the mid-1970s. The notion of the arts and accessibility, the kind of accessibility Beth was talking about, really wasn't in the viewfinder when the endowment was launched. Sculpture in glass was thought of as a craft, off to the side. Poetry could be found in the literature program. In fact, Michigan had a Poets in the Schools uh, program by 1967. But poetry was quiet, not out loud. My third point is that the endowment, despite these challenges, has achieved remarkable things. In 1965, consider this, 1965, there were about 6,500 cultural nonprofits in the US. Today, there are well over 120,000. Further, the arts are today an organized sector of the economy. Through advocacy groups like Americans for the Arts and Dance USA, the League of American Orchestras, and many state and community advocacy groups, working often in concert, to invest in and support the dreams of artists and the objectives of arts organizations. Expansion and this kind of organized effort enable the NEA to become a real hub around which ideas about the arts, public funding, innovative programming could revolve. And as your Michigan experience illustrates, state arts agencies were important from the beginning. But I'll be honest, from the start, relations between the endowment and these agencies exhibited both a high degree of cooperation and a certain amount of tension. A percentage of the endowment's budget was always passed directly to the states, 10% at first, then 20%, now a whopping 40%, and that could be the subject of another speech, like the one on jazz. And state councils were helpful in implementing NEA programs on the ground. I remember that my mother, Grace Ivey, uh, an English teacher in Calumet, Michigan, had the benefit of an NEA Arts Council funded Poets in the Schools visit by a wonderful, wonderful poet and novelist, Jim Harrison, who is both, has both a, an undergraduate degree from Michigan State and a, and a master's degree, Poets in the Schools. Also, back in 67, a long time ago, also state and cities helped incubate some important ideas. The Art Train Project, which was thoroughly embraced by the NEA, was created here in Michigan. But state and city leaders were often justifiably put out when the endowment would make a direct grant to an orchestra or for the commission of public art, insist on significant local matching support, and then swoop in for an opening or an unveiling, placing the NEA chairman in the spotlight, pushing the staff and supporters of state and local arts organizations into the background. Consider the 42-ton Alexander Calder sculpture, La Grande Vitesse, installed in downtown Grand Rapids in 1969. Paid for in part by a $45,000 grant from the endowment's then brand new public art program, but it was also matched by $83,000 in local funds. Now, it's a signature piece, to be certain, and one that remains a community landmark. But it's also an example of the way our federal agency could, and still does today, take credit, while the city, in fact, paid most of the bill. 
So there are tensions. When I became chairman in 1998, I inherited big challenges in the NEA's relationship with Congress. Again, another separate talk. But state, federal relations were also tense. And one of my very first tasks was to get out among the states, the commissions and councils to diffuse some long simmering resentments. So that's the history. Where are we now? Over the NEA's first 50 years, the agency has witnessed and in fact has helped create a mature nonprofit community. And the mature cohort of state agencies, those entities that define much of the arts today. It's a remarkable success story. But there are problems. We call them challenges, but there, there are problems. Our nonprofit sector is big, but big can in some cases mean overbuilt. In many communities, nonprofits compete almost viciously for limited resources, grants, donations, and for audiences. There are far too many of America's arts organizations today that live hand to mouth, with management's eyes of necessity fixed constantly on the bottom line. Another challenge, the NEA has, after all, never been a true endowment. In fact, it's a small federal agency dependent on annual appropriations. The budgetary generosity of the White House, OMB, the willingness of Congress to vote its support for, to appropriate funding levels as part of the Interior Bill's appropriation process. And as everybody in Michigan who's worked with the Council over the years knows from experience, if you run to, into a tax-cutting administration or legislature, Arts funding can be one of the first things cut. This truth means that for the NEA and for the states, politics really matters. In the early 1990s, nearly one-third of endowment grants went to New York State because that's where the big fine arts organizations were located. And at the same time, a few visual arts grants, I'll mention the names Maplethorpe and Serrano, familiar to the old timers here, perhaps less so to students, became very controversial. And no surprise, the NEA found itself in political hot water. It underwent a one-third budget cut. And to this day, content, what you fund, and distribution, where you fund it, those two are constant challenges, and it's a cha those are challenges here in Washington and, of course, here in Michigan. And despite forays into funding folk festivals and Broadway theater and poetry out loud, the core of agency support still goes to European fine arts. This has been the endowment's orientation from the beginning, uh, and it's uh, from the creation of the NEA. There was simply an assumption that what the nation needed was more classical music, more performing arts centers, more regional theater companies, new and expanded museums, and so on. In the beginning, in the beginning, nobody asked, what is American art? Why is it uniquely important? How do we celebrate art forms that are a special representation of the American experience? And much of our work in the arts and in culture still begs these same questions. So together, we have done an outstanding job at 50. Many in this room have led in this endeavor, done an excellent job of convincing corporate donors, foundations, and government agencies that the arts, as an amenity, can have special value. The arts are useful. Rocco Landsman's slogan as NEA chairman, art works. And I'd like to dwell just a bit as I begin to conclude here on this idea of art and culture as an amenity. An amenity is something that's nice. It's positive, but it's not essential. An amenity is something you get around to when you've solved all of life's real problems. An amenity might be shown to have certain utility. The arts can stimulate economic development and music education can help kids do better on standardized tests. We have all made these arguments, and they've worked, but I think we've gone about as far as we can go. Because fundamentally, an amenity, even a useful one, is something that can be marginalized or eliminated when budgets get tight, or when national security or disease or a soft economy seem to be, demand our full attention. Think of Detroit's Art Institute. At one point, really faced with the, with the choice between paintings or pensions. Fortunately, the choice never really had to be made, but it was certainly framed. 
In some ways, given this truth, it's remarkable that we've been able to grow a mature nonprofit sector in an environment in which creative practice and artistic heritage have never been a first-tier public policy priority. So this is the challenge that points the way toward how we must move ahead in the next half century. We need to reposition, reframe art, creative practice, and cultural heritage, moving it from the amenity category, take it out of amenity, into the list of essential public policy objectives. And this is for the young people here. You're going to have to work on this. Two ideas for reassessing or revaluing art and cultural vitality. This is a big one. First, I think we're at the end of a century-long infatuation with the idea that a life of purpose in America can be put together through devotion to work, commitment to the accumulation of wealth, and the pursuit of happiness through consumption. I think there are plenty of signs that's beginning to wind down. And we know incomes are worse than stagnant. They're actually in decline. <laughs> Occupations that once offered deep satisfaction, immaterial satisfactions, I think of law, medicine, airline piloting, teaching, today have been eroded by technologies that substitute the clicks on an iPad for insight, knowledge, creativity, and empathy. Work is simply less appealing, not only less rewarding. Our nation in much of the world and much of the world has indulged in a century-long embrace of the idea that work and the pursuit of wealth could produce lives of purpose. We have surrendered to the demands of work, pursued wealth, also consumption, often at the expense of family and relations with our community. The framework supporting this false dream is beginning to crack. Perhaps the truth is that today, when a newly minted college student takes a job at Starbucks, it's not only what you would call a failure to launch. It's a very unfortunate phrase. But instead constitutes a decision, perhaps one that's hard to articulate, a little unconscious, to step aside from an outmoded 20th, 20th century model of career and consumption that simply no longer promises life satisfaction. If I'm right, if our confidence in work and wealth is eroding, what do we do? Do we just despair as a country? Maybe. But I believe the cultural community can offer an alternative, a deepened engagement with cultural heritage and creative practice as a pathway to a life of meaning and purpose. I've written books about cultural rights, advancing the idea of expressive life, defining culture as something both individual and shared, multidimensional, above all, essential. Expressive life contains cultural heritage, linking, with, linking us with community, tradition from the past. Expressive life is the arena of personal creative practice, activity that, uh, that, that allows us a sense of strong achievement. In short, from a policy perspective, a vibrant expressive life constitutes an affordable, achieve it, achievable pathway to a life of purpose and meaning for all. If our century-old addiction to work and wealth has opened a hole in the soul of our nation, there is an opportunity for cultural vitality to fill that empty space. Embracing the arts, cultural heritage, and creative practice in a new way, not as something we get around to when times are good and money is easy, but as an essential path to a life of purpose and meaning. Now, thinking big is okay. That's my big idea. You may disagree with it. And I've been accused with some justification of always operating up at 30,000 feet. But the real evidence is right in front of us right here tonight. What do Yvonne, Nadim, Craig, Coral show us? Why does access, why does accessibility matter? Yes, they give us art, native crafts, music, sculpture, literature but each is living proof that cultural heritage and creative practice constitute a reservoir of satisfaction, happiness, purpose, and meaning. And I think each one of them demonstrated that to us tonight. We must make the amenity essential if the next 50 years are to be as important to the arts as was the last half century. This will not be easy because to accomplish this transformation, to place a vibrant, expressive life as a critical value at the very center of American public policy at every level of government 
we must make our big, true argument, while at the very same time we're down in the trenches, making certain that we don't run a deficit next year. So tonight we can celebrate 50 years, and I hope we will take up the essential challenge of transforming the character of America's expressive life. Thank you very much.